So as I said, we are going to talk about uh, handing over tools in today's session, and it's a very important and essential topic that you will need to cover with uh, nursing staff, with the with the with residents, and I think challenge will be discussing the same topic with the consultants because I think that's the most difficult group of people whom you can actually you know bring them to a formal kind of a handing over. But then, if you can bring this up in a manner that they they see a value in it i'm sure they will at least make sure that the residents do it in a very systematic manner at least if that part can be looked after even then we can ensure continuity of care and patient safety but i think biggest challenge is to convince them that this is as important as all clinical activities that we do around the around the patient so as i was saying earlier also that this topic i would always say start with uh, if you remember the activity we did in session 1 and that was chinese wave whisper so if you can start i mean uh, the session with chinese whisper this will really you know um, let them see the importance of this topic because then they'll realize see, this is how when we communicate we end up into so much of distortion of message and inaccuracy and lack of precision then they they tend to value so uh, i i thought of doing it but i said you have already done it so there's no point now spending another 15 minutes on it but to recommend i'll say that start this activity with that i mean this topic with that activity so if i may ask you what kind of challenges are you facing when it comes to handing over tools in your setup or handing over as such if not particularly any tool but challenges that you are facing in handing over usually it is sketchy mm -hmm. and like we keep telling them that you should go from bed to bed and hand over that doesn't happen they mm -hmm. usually hand over on the files mm -hmm. so that is uh, what happens and when they are handing over on the files so uh, because you are not relating it to the patient it is never adequate and you are quite right it's quite a bain of our life convincing people ki nahi proper and hand over to proper hand over to absolutely quite a problem absolutely. yeah absolutely absolutely any other any other experience or yeah doctor yeah go ahead uh good evening ma'am good evening good all ma'am staff is always in a hurry to reach home when their duty gets turned off so they don't hand over properly and uh, most of the times we miss the very high risk patients who are admitted in our hospital since long time mm -hmm. and uh, especially if it is a night duty because they don't hand over and at night it happens that patient enter into the uh, full term complications at 2 or 3 am then the consultant shout on us that why you did not tell me so mm -hmm. this all because they did not hand it properly so mm -hmm. i agree because of you know poor handing over and taking over i think lot of uh, uh, you know uh, cases get complicated delay in treatment wrong treatment complications poor outcome i think that's so true and it's not just in our country i think even jci has been able to identify handing over as a bermuda triangle of healthcare because that's where most of the information gets lost and it's now not reported in the right manner yeah dr anuradha has mentioned a point that Uh, sometimes few key points are go go missing, and if it's not just verbal handing over, so writing key notes are very important. Agreed, yeah, I think you are very right. Writing is very important. So when I ask nurses how do you hand over, uh, they would always, you know, say, "Ma'am, we go bed to bed, and we hand over, you know, bed to bed." So if I ask them, okay, in case if the next staff comes late. so then how do you hand over and where do you hand over i mean case if the lay next staff is late then we are also in hurry to go home then we do it in the uh, nurses station okay in case if the next staff is further late for example just like almost like 5 7 minutes late then the actual time of their arrival and then we do it in the changing room while we are changing simultaneously we we hand over the patients okay in case if the next staff is further late another say 15 20 minutes and you have also changed and you are just waiting for that person to come then where do you hand over when we do it at the gate and i'll just say everything is written in the nurses note if you have any confusion call me and ask me so that's the way we are handing over when i ask doctors how do you hand over 
ये सब ठीक है इन दो को देख लेना That's the way we are handling it, and I think that's one of the biggest challenge healthcare system is facing because we are not ready to fall in line. We believe treating patient is a personal affair. It's a team affair. There are so many people, especially patients with comorbidity. There are so many as consultants attending, and if they don't lie in between each other, probably sometimes. physician thinks that okay since the patient is in the care of in the care of a surgeon so i automatically diabetes and hypertension will be looked after because when they know the patient has this comorbidity they need to be attended the surgeon might think okay this patient is under doctor so and so so diabetes and hypertension he has been looking looking after for so many you know um, uh, years so i i don't need to get into it and plus he is a specialist i may do something wrong so diabetes and hypertension is his responsibility so poor patient you may have received lot of patients from other hospitals with a very sketchy summary which doesn't give you any meaning which is very you know useless and sometimes you know you really have to struggle and especially if there is no patient's attendant who can give you complete history sometimes the patient is brought by a distant relative or a neighbor or somebody who took to one hospital then they brought the patient to you you get that sketchy summary which is of no use i really do not know how many of your residents really know how to write a referral note do they really have any format i don't think how many of them really know how to write a patient's case sheet if they are following any format again i am not sure so these are all nothing but handing over tools See, it's not just the shift of change. I mean, change of shift among nurses or among doctors. When the patient is going from one care area to another one, for example, from ICU to ward, what was patient receiving? What has been given? What needs to be done now? What is the condition? Everything has to be, you know, categorically mentioned in the summary. Then people would say, "We do write. We write everything. We write, you know, transfer notes." My question to the people who receive is how many of you really read the case sheet we just read the last you know para or page where it is written treatment such and such whatever the past few days when the patient has been under somebody's care so what i am trying to highlight is the the value of this note is not probably really understood well that's why we are having lapses in handing over dr tanu i think you wish to make a point please go ahead Ma'am, unmute your device. Another important point is when we ask for a referral, hmm. like okay, physician referral le lena ya gynecologist referral le lena. Oh. So consultant will tell the resident, resident will tell the junior resident, junior resident will tell the nurse, and the information the way is missed because why particularly you have asked for a referral that doesn't get conveyed to the other physician or. Uh, consultant that is absolutely. also an important point here yeah. absolutely absolutely i completely agree i mean the sketchy notes in terms of referral notes what i have read often is refer to ophthalmology refer to gynae refer yeah. to psychiatry for what for what so if you are referring to uh, ophthalmology uh, ophthalm ophthalm ophthalmologist would come and visit and then he'll say okay this patient requires for dust check up so again now he'll go and get his ophthalmoscope and come back again so it's a waste of a visit so referral note has to be something like it's like a trailer of the movie you, where you are actually saying this is the patient this is the case this is what is required that's where we are referring to you and what are our concerns that i we, we we want you to rule out or to confirm for us and it's not difficult it's so very simple but only thing is following system we find challenging following system we find restricting that's one of the biggest challenge we we see among uh, especially doctors when it comes to you know even even i for example very few people know the right way of writing a case uh, file your assessment notes i mean and there are so many beautiful formats available right on google search i mean you can you can pick up one then refine it as per your requirement 
implement it and see how it needs to be improvised as per your requirement. And then one day you will have your own, you know, um, either referral note or case sheet or assessment sheet, because then you would know this is what I uh, we, we need to implement in our individual system. So the idea is that I think we need to, first of all, understand the importance of handing over tools. And also this has to be, you know, uh, percolated to, to the lowest level where they understand even sanitary staff before going has to hand over in case if there's a tap leaking or there's a uh, you know toilet block or there is no water or there's a message for water shortage or whatever it is so that value uh, i mean and that is something that they need to really learn because the next person who is coming in has no idea and one message if you can emphasize among your team is handover is never given handover is always taken if you are good at taking hand handover you are less likely to make mistake because then you would know i have asked about all this and i have an answer to it so one message very clearly you should be able to give to your team or your staff is that handover is never given it is always taken because whatever happens in your duty will be counted as lapses in your care and if you have effectively taken over then you can prevent those errors in the care so let me quickly share one slide with you and ask you a question around it one second Uh, look at this slide and uh, read the whole para, but little attention, more attention to the line that I have underlined and tell me what message do you, you are likely to register from this paragraph. What do you say? What line are you likely to remember? Nothing much to do. Nothing much to do. Plant discharge uh, the next day and nothing is required to be done. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, what about this slide? Again, what are you going to remember? Sickest patient. Sickest patient is Rani. So all other patients are fine. We don't have to do much for them. All your attention has to be on this patient. And as a result, a lot of time, we become focused on one or two patients and then rest of the patient's needs are kind of compromised. Whenever... We are handing over, for example, the person who is handing over has done almost eight to 10 hours their duty, extremely tired and exhausted, hungry, sleepy, wanting to go home. You can well imagine what will be the state of that person's mind. The person who is receiver has just come in, taking time to settle and also kind of in hurry to you know, start working or whatever is due to do that. So in this slide, if you see, the sender would say a lot of things, but what will Ginger remember? Ginger. And this is what exactly happens in handing over and taking over. Because you would not register much, much because of a lot of reasons. Some of the cognitive processes besides fatigue, sleep, hunger, that can interfere with handoff is selective listening, selective attention, selective forgetting. And you will see this happening a lot of time. Let me see if I can show you a video on it. Uh, 
and see if it works for us. So in this video, you need to count how many times, give me a second. Searching for a better way to collaborate with your team? This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Keep a count. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. How many could you count? 12. How many? 12. I could count 12. 12. 11. 11. 12. 9. 9. 9. And how many of you saw a beer also? 10 C. Dr. Savita saw it. How many of you saw beer? Anybody? No? Um, I've, seen, I've seen this video before, but I did not notice the beer this time also. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's, let's, let's see this once again. But did you see the gorilla? This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching on DVDs from Fizcog Productions. Oh my goodness, why is it not going off? Learn more at theinvisiblegorilla.com. The gorilla wants to stay mad. See how many of us did not, a lot of us, I think most of us, unless you have seen the video earlier and you had an idea, yes, this is the question I'm going to ask. This is what happens when we are focusing on one point, all other points becomes invisible to the mind. So selective attention, selective listening, selective forgetting are very common you know, uh, cognitive processes that interfere with the handing over. Handing over is considered Bermuda Triangle of Healthcare. I hope you know about Bermuda Triangle. I hope you all know. There's one place, yeah. but it's still very uh, you know, doubtful whether it actually uh, does, does this really exist or it's just a theory. But there's one place where anything that passes through that area gets sucked in to the extent they have claimed even the aeroplanes, not just the water bodies, but I mean, not just the uh, ships and the uh, other uh, water vehicles, but even airplanes, they have, they have said that that gets, you know, sucked in. I do not know the reality of that, but then I know, yes, in healthcare, we are really facing challenges, something like Barunda Triangle, because even JCI has found that patient care handoff communication is one of the critical safety and quality problems. So if you are struggling with this, this is nothing new. That's because I think we have not been able to still emphasize the role and importance of effective handing over. You know, more than 3,000 sentinel events were assessed from 1995 to 2004. And it revealed 65% of the reported problems are because of poor communication and which actually increased to 70% by 2005. 
and 50% of them were during the handoff because the handoff procedure is not followed systematically. So why do you think effective handover still remains a primary challenge in healthcare? Why? You said the challenges that you have mentioned, but why do you think we are facing those challenges? So as you said, that handing over is not done properly. In how many hospitals do we have the protocol of overlapping time between the two shifts? Do we have that? So if you have not assigned time for handing over, who will do the handing over? See, the person who is going off the duty will not be willing to stay back beyond his or her time. The person who is to come and join will never be ready to come before time to take over because that's not within the duty. And any idea how much time will it take, for example, a ward of say 40, 50 patients? If I may take like common setup or in a private setup, maybe on a floor, we will have around 20 patients. So how much time do you think will take per patient to hand over? Yes. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Which is very less, I think. 30 seconds is very less. It would take almost like one to two minutes. Because when you go near a patient, when you when I will share the protocol of handing over, there's a lot that you need to be handing over. Not just, okay, he's fine, his medicines have been given, or he's getting, no. There is a way that we need to hand over. Even if we spend, say, one minute, or even if I say, by, go by what you say, 30 seconds. For a 50-bedded ward, 30 seconds means we need 25 minutes time to hand over a, a set of 50 patients. And if we do not have that overlapping time between two shifts, who will be willing to give that extra time? So I think one of the major reason is we have not kept any specific time for the handing over and taking over. For example, if the shift is to end at two o'clock, the next shift staff is not expected to report at two, but his or her Reporting time is from 1.30 to maybe 7.30 if you don't want to increase the number of hours, whatever it is. Not that, that we say that, okay, you will be working for six and a half hours or seven hours or whatever the time, follow that time. But then there has to be overlapping of time. We do not have set protocols of handing over. Somebody likes to follow one system, the other one likes to follow the other system. Then also the challenge is handing over in all the areas cannot be uniform. For example, if it is a handing over in a, in a say, uh, emergency department, ED. So there probably it is more like, you know, whatever set of patients you have now, they are going to move to their respective wards or they're going to get discharged in the next six hours. So the handing over will be different. It's a labor room, that handing over will be a different thing. In OT, handing over is done differently. In ICU, it is different. In, in CCU, it's again very different. So imagine the complexity of the handing over because each department has its different information needs to be transferred to the next person. So as a result of all this, handing over is still a challenge. Plus, we do not have much research on it. I think this is one thing as a healthcare system. I remember one of the hospitals approached me from Bombay and uh, he he he's a uh, he's a cardiologist he's a cardiologist and he said i see a lot of lapses in care and i have been able to identify also and i want to send that data to you and discuss with you what else can be done where so that we can you know reduce the number of lapses this doctor probably did the data collection on his own so he had to seek permission from his uh, management before sharing the data with me he didn't get it because we are scared of, you know, uh, opening our own Pandora box. And research can never be done without actually working in the system and observing and making recordings. 
And unless you do research, you will not know what is going to work in your area. Research is the only way to improve. So research. So for example, even when you want to get your house renovated, you will ask a builder to come and assess the building. You will ask architect to come and give you the architectural designs. You will ask the uh, uh, you know uh, interior decorator to come and tell you what will work in my area. But that means you need you need to be open to having people to your place to come and see what is happening. So these are a couple of uh, you know issues, dilemmas that you must have seen. We don't have any structured uh, you know uh, handover tools. Then uh, it's mostly one way. You must have seen most of the talking is done by the person who is handing over. Taking over person is usually silently listening. So when you are silently listening, who knows whether you are really getting exactly what the person who is handing over is, if you are receiving that. Are you really understanding? Do you have any doubts? And if you are just listening and not noting down anything, there's a possibility that you will forget almost all of it the moment that person will leave. Then, as I said, time is a challenge because we don't keep any you know, overlapping time. Commitment is a challenge and it's not just commitment by the staff, even commitment by the leadership. If you have an arrangement of overlapping time and if you strictly implement it and ensure that this happens in your system, that shows leadership's commitment. That shows the management commitment. Automatically, it will start implementing in the time to come. Then it requires process changes. For example, if residents are not in habit of handing over, taking over, they will not be willing to do it. Consultants also will not be willing to do it. If you ask two consultants to you know, uh, work on a case and collaborate, you will have challenges. And that requires process changes, which requires a lot of commitment from all, all the team players. Then there is extreme variability and uniqueness of handoff. As I said, different areas have different requirement. So you cannot have one handing over tool and implement all across the hospital. Plus we don't have any focused research as of now also to actually help us with the, you know, the right tools that will help us. This is one study that I would like to share with you. In this study, they uh, picked up 12 patients, simulated patients, and they did five rounds of conductive handover. And they used three different styles. One was where they were just verbally handing over. Second was just the notes, like we all are still practicing. We have a tool and we just fill in that tool and we put it in the patient's case file or maybe wherever we have the practice of keeping the handing over notes. The third was that there was a standardized format with verbal handover. And the studies, study showed in verbal handover loss of almost all the data. With the notes taking, it resulted into 31% of the loss. Because when you are not visiting the notes, there's a possibility you may lose the uh, information. But the standardized format with verbal handover resulted in minimal loss. So that shows that it's not just the notes, but it is also verbal handing over that's required. So this is, uh, you know, uh, the ineffective handover can lead to so many things, for example, wrong treatment, delay in treatment, severe adverse events, patient complaints, increased healthcare cost, even the length of stay can, you know, increase and many more. So in wrong treatment, you may have seen a lot of time, if it is not properly handed over. I mean, there can be treatment, you know, mismanagement. In delay in treatment, we all know, a patient requires medicine at a particular time. If the next staff is not told, I remember in my own uh, relative case, she was admitted for bariatric surgery and she was you know, experiencing respiratory distress. So she was put in ICU to uh, stabilize her. And uh, she was on BiPAP and she was uh, being given uh, you know, uh, injection Lasix. And uh, the uh, evening staff forgot to give her injection Lasix. And while going, she handed over to the nurse who came in around eight o'clock or nine o'clock that I forgot to give her Lasix, please give her injection Lasix. So this staff, after doing everything around 10, 10, 30, she, she went and gave Lasix to this patient. Now this patient on BiPAP in ICU, obese patient, 
she she was given lasik so you can imagine after lasik what would happen she would repeatedly require bed pan she kept ringing the bell the staff like the support staff and the cleaning staff normally on night duty they they prefer to have minimal you know disturbance but this lady because she was given lasik so naturally she needed the bed pan uh, quite often she kept ringing the bell either nobody came or when they came they were really very upset and annoyed with with uh, with her that you are disturbing us and you are troubling her but see what happens then we have seen severe adverse events happening in our system where the next staff has not taken you know uh, take over properly a lot of time a patient has been complaining for something you did not attend it and by the time you realize the patient has gone into complication and all of us have seen something like this referral was sent we did not do the follow up nobody came in okay we wanted to discharge this patient but before we discharge we have to get this patient examined by maybe ophthalmologist or psychiatrist or some other specialist that patient person has not you know has been informed or we have not followed up so patient stays for another one or two days so that way increase in healthcare cost length in stay length of stay getting you know unnecessary uh, you know uh, delay discharge getting delayed because of this so all this is because of ineffective handing over that we we uh, you know follow see handing over is more like a painting a picture what happened in the 8 hours that when you were on duty 8 or 10 or 12 hours so you will have to literally paint a picture which you have seen so you have an idea so in that picture you have to give all the relevant information that happened during your tenure of being with the patient and specific directions that need to be given for the work that the next staff has to do maybe keeping this patient empty stomach maybe getting some investigation done maybe sending a referral maybe getting the reports from a particular department whatever it is so whatever directions you need to give that has to be given very clearly with the rational so that the the next staff knows what needs to be done and why we need to do it and then at the same time the sender is responsible to check whether the receiver has really understood or not how many of us really check that whether the person has really understood i don't think we ever say tell me what have you understood or explain me in your words what exactly i have said on the other side the receiver also has a responsibility so it's not like monologue it's not like one way receiver has the responsibility of first of all listening attentively second is asking questions if something is not clear or you want to understand further or something that is not from making sense to you asking questions so that you clearly know what it is about then having a system to remember important information for example having a small maybe notebook where you can note down for each patient whatever the instructions are or whatever the you know uh, the the directions are and then read back or tell in your words this is what i understand and check with the sender is it correct have i understood it correct so that's the responsibility of the receiver so it's not like <clears throat> passing the buck it's like passing the torch so both the giver and the receiver of the patient uh, patient information have important responsibilities for ensuring effective handoff and each party must be comfortable with the information exchange so A lot of time you will see the the next staff will say, "I know everything. Go go go. I'll manage. I, I come every day. It's nothing new for me. It is new. Yesterday we had a different set of patients. We had a different set of information. Today it's a different set of patients. It's a new situation, new information. So even if you have been working in the same department for ten years, what do you know about this patient? Will just come in. So again, this idea of go go go. I know everything. I'll manage. Don't worry." it's not a good idea so both of them have to you know value the information that the uh, sender wants to give and handoff is not a quick down and dirty exchange of a few facts but a coordinated effort among two professionals or a group of professionals so for example when a resident tries to brief the consultant what happened in his or her duty how many times the consultant is okay with the idea of the resident briefing the uh, consultant 
a lot of time you will hear them saying, don't teach me, I know, I know this case. Information gets lost in that process. So really the concept of handing over, we should learn from some of the high reliability organizations. Organizations like nuclear power, NASA, aviation, even dispatch services. Let it be like the postal service or the courier service. They are doing an excellent job of properly taking over and handing over. Very rarely you will see any mismanagement on that front. If you have seen aviation staff, the way they have a checklist, the way they have they confirm the checklist, the flight cannot take off unless the ground staff has inspected everything, signed the document and handed over to the, to the flying officer. Only then the flight can take off. And you know, the number of errors we are making in comparison to aviation, it's like something like one is to 33,000 errors. That's a clear show of the poor handing over, taking over that we are managing. That's why it is considered safer to work in a nuclear power, you know, uh, this thing place or, or uh, aviation industry or, you know, NASA because they're following the protocols so meticulously that there are hardly any chances of mismanagement or any risk to the staff or to any, any stakeholder. So the definition of handing over in healthcare is a handoff is a transfer and acceptance of patient care responsibility through effective communication. And it's a real time process. You can't do it anytime. It has to be done when you are going and the person comes in and passing of patient-specific information from one caregiver to another or from one team of caregiver to another. For example, you are transferring the patient from a primary care center to a tertiary care center. So you need to give complete information so that the moment somebody reads that somebody would know what this patient is all about. All salient things has to be there because we know if the patient, we are moving the patient from one care area to the higher care area, it is, it, it, this is the patient who requires care of specialist or super specialist. So probably they will not get time to go through the whole case sheet. Can I summarize all that in one sheet and send it with the patient so that anybody who sees the notes can know what this patient is all about. And then that would actually help you, you know, ensure continuity of care and safety of the patient. I like this definition of JCI. So I thought I must bring this to you. And it's a very simple definition, which explains us why we need to do it and how we need to do it. So where all have you seen the uh, changing uh, handoff in your regular routine? Or where, where all in your hospital, you see handing over, taking over being practiced? Nurses, we all know, we, we consider that, yes, they are doing it. What we are else? Maintenance staff. Maintenance, maintenance, yes. Even they are supposed to be handing over in a very systemic manner. Very true. Residents? Doctors and residents. Doctors and residents. Patient going from one care area to another care area, from OT to the ICU or OT to ward, or from ward to ICU, from ED to ward. So it can be anything between the nurses when there's a shift change. It could be a change of level of care from OT to ICU or ICU to ward. Even the doctor's shift change requires handing over. Physician transferring care from one care area to another care area. Patients being transferred out or transferred in the hospital, even there we need to have a proper way of uh, handing over and taking over. So what are the types of handoffs that you have heard of? Besides this, have you heard of critical report? I'm sure you must have heard of. Even critical report is also a kind of a handoff. You are in lab, you have seen a report, you need to inform to the patient or to the uh, uh, attending doctor that this patient's reports are seriously abnormal and that need attention. I mean, how many times have you received something like this from your lab or from any lab for that matter? 
because i know you are in a prime week years kind of a setup yes ma'am yes ma'am we often used to get such kind of reports from the labs especially uh in hemoglobin patient is anemic and the report which they gave of hemoglobin most of the time it used to be so controversial that oh. patient was critical uh, clinically she looked to be so anemic but the hemoglobin was of uh, 10 or 11 so we used to tell them that kindly do repeat it again okay but how many times if the report is actually four or five they will immediately call you or inform you that they do ma'am only one or two times not more than that so what critical reporting i am talking about is this we have this staff in the lab needs to inform the attending doctor about the critical values that because there is a normal range and there is a critical range it's always displayed in the lab the staff knows okay if the the findings are higher than this or lower than this i need to immediately inform the the attending doctor that's called critical uh, report uh, similarly in on call responsibilities when you are calling somebody you would be using some protocol so these are also areas where you need to know how to you know write your notes or inform them hospital transfers for example a patient now is being transferred from the hospital to maybe a local care hospital for example a, a patient has come from a different state operated recuperating but still requires maybe dressing or maybe injections or maybe something so you are sending this patient to their you know uh, to their hometown and also attaching them to their local care hospital where they can go for you know for follow up so even that requires proper writing up notes so that they know okay this is what this case is all about and this we have discussed already the patient is going in the same hospital to different department even then you need to you know have a clear notes about the patient so one of the tools that we we have seen which some of the hospitals have used it's called uh five p's principle have you heard of this has anybody heard of this okay so this is one of the probably most basic kind of a tool that you may you will come across and uh, the the five p's are tell about the patient tell what you plan to do what is the purpose what problems do you uh, see or foresee and what precautions do you suggest so i'll give you, i'll take a very simple example patient ram 54 years to be kept empty stomach for barium milk test he is diabetic so check his blood sugar every hourly to avoid hyperglycemia so even for example in labor room if you are handing over a patient okay this is a patient primary came at this time this is what is the situation wait for this long and in case if there is no you know uh, low labor progression this is what we intend to but this is a very basic kind of a tool it cannot be implemented all across the hospitals but some of the hospitals are still using it as a way of having a structured communication because still you would have some structure although it's very simple and basic and it cannot be implemented in all care areas okay uh make an attempt now with five p's for this case this is the case that we had seen in the first slide so try writing your notes in the chat box so that i know according to you what will come under what p so first p is patient second p is plan then purpose problems and precautions okay kishor 14 year old male so this is about patient okay patient kishor okay so maybe if you put all together then it will be better do you want me to give you the format in the chat box give me one second let me see if i can copy paste
So I've sent the format in the chat box. So if you will press enter button, everything will start uploading. So it's better if you write everything and then you press enter button. Okay, uh, Dr. Anuradha Agrawal, you have said patient Kishore, 14 years boy, plan can go home, purpose is improving, problem persistent, asthma with URI, precaution should go only if he can be weaned off oxygen. Okay, good attempt. And Dr. Kunal says patient Kishore plan wean off oxygen, purpose no longer very sick, problem mild persistent, preca asthma, precaution, not very sure. Okay. So if I may ask all of you, in the format that you are writing in, that is five Ps, what do you think we are still missing that should be part of the handing over? What, if we are giving this information in that five P kind of a format, what, information are we missing or what more should have been there ma'am charting of charting of the oxygen okay charting of oxygen duration and how much we are giving the patient absolutely very good very good attempt and the present treatment absolutely we haven't talked about the treatment at all. What medicines is the patient taking to continue, to discontinue, to wean off, to reduce, or what is the plan of action? So, as I said, 5P is a very basic kind of a handing over tool, which is not applicable in most of the areas. You will see a lot of important information gets missed if we are handing over in that way. So, like Anuradha said, medication. It's very important to talk about medicines. Like Amreen said, in case if the oxygen level goes up or low, what is the, the uh, you know, amount of oxygen we need to be giving? And what about infection? How are we treating? Is the patient fine, still having infection? And then nutrition, an important, you know, communication that needs to be made, which usually get lost in the process. And we normally do not care much about the you know, nutrition. Another important thing that we need to remember is contingency plan, which is not covered in this uh, five piece. If Kishore has an increasing oxygen requirement, what needs to be done? We are hoping he's going tomorrow. Suppose he has a relapse. Suppose his condition deteriorates. What needs to be done? And in case if he's in his febrile, what does that indicate and what we need to do? And then, of course, if the IV falls, that means about nutrition. We know if the patient is doing well and doesn't require IV and the patient is going to go home tomorrow, then maybe 
you'll have to also talk about the nutrition, what needs to be given now. And if IV falls out, we can, we need not replace it and we can move to oral uh, food. So what I'm trying to say that even these are important. I'm sorry. Oh God. Why is it jumping? Yeah. So in, the, in that 5P simple kind of a setup, these things do not get covered, but these should be part and parcel of the uh, communication. This is one thing that I would advise you to do with your participants. I do not have time here because we, we, we are focusing on a lot of things, but I have done this activity when I do a full day program with, with the doctors and nurses and I make them do this activity. So what I do in the activities, I'll ask them to write 10 things that they think according to them are most important that needs to be communicated to the next staff. Or if they are taking over, what all do you think you will need to know about a patient? So individually, they'll make a list. And then I would break them into smaller groups. For example, if we say I have around 30 participants in a group. So what I would do, I would make five groups of six members each. And then I'll ask them to now sit with their team members and come up with a list of 10 things collectively to see what they think is most important that they would like to receive as a handover. And then once everybody has done this activity, now ask them to come up with the final list. This way one is they'll become aware of what needs to be shared, what needs to be collected, when, what information has what implication. So I have done this activity a number of times with my participants and most of the times this is what they finally come out with. That they say, we need to know at least this much about a patient. Now, if you are collecting information on these 10 things about a patient, it cannot be done in just 30 seconds. At least two to three minutes. But again, it depends how serious is the patient? What is patient's condition? It's day one. Probably you do not know anything you need to know in detail. If it is day three, you already are familiar with the patient and nothing much has changed and probably very little will have to be communicated. But this is something each one of us should know about our patient whom we are taking over. So in a way, you will be able to earn their commitment on properly handing over. And also they would understand the importance of effective handing board if you make them do. This takes around 25, 30 minutes to do the activity, but it's worth the investment because you are able to engage them in this activity. And I would advise that you must, if you are talking about handing over, you can use full one session just to you know cover this topic. Then uh, what are the you know barriers to uh, effective communication. What do you think uh, interferes with the uh, effective communication? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, this is uh, just wanted to, uh, regarding the hand take handover. Yeah. Uh, one more. Lapse. This is not related to this topic. Ma'am, one second. Sure. sure. Uh, like, during ambulance transportation. Because yes. some uh, sometimes ambulance they will outsource it. So there's some uh, there. How does the handover happen? And I think that is also a very crucial uh, Absolutely. area. Where, yeah. Absolutely, and especially if the ambulance service is outsourced, and every time the the person who will bring in the patient is not your regular employee and not your yes. regular, uh, I completely agree. So yes. I think again, if you have a protocol of a proper system where you, you know that this is the basic information you will require. So the first person who will come in touch with, in, in contact with the patient's attendant will suppo is supposed to be gathering the information. Or from wherever you are receiving the patient, for, for example, if you are receiving the patient from a, 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 from a nursing home, then the person working in the nursing home is supposed to send a summary of the of the patient. But then definitely, right. and when we are sending the patient out 
to another hospital, we have to make sure that we send that summary with the transfer notes as a summary with the patient. But I completely right. agree. If it's a patient, it's an ambulance brought, you know, who has brought the patient with no information, you will have to start from scratch. You have to really start from scratch. I completely agree. Right. Yeah. So what barriers do you think that interfere with the effective communication? For example, if I say human fallibility, what do you understand by this? We all make mistakes. mistakes. And if we are doing it in an unstructured manner, somebody might, might forget, somebody might not pay attention, somebody might be preoccupied with something. So all that can, you know, ultimately end up into the errors that we all make. There's a very beautiful book. Uh, I, I Let me, let me, uh, you know, recollect the name. It's worth reading. I would request you to read that and that will tell you when we say it's just 0.1% error, but when you will calculate in terms of the actual volume, you will be surprised to you know the, the errors that we all make. So yeah, to err is human. The books, have you read it? To yeah. Err is human. It's a beautiful book. It's worth reading. You must read, it will open your eyes to the idea that we take errors so lightly, but how they actually interfere with the outcome and compromise patients' continuity of care. Then systems are very complex, and especially with, with advanced technology, AI getting into it, systems are becoming further complex. So a lot of time information gets lost because of the complex system, complex treatments, and then uh, when we don't have a you know system to cope up with it. Then limitations of learning and training. Not all of us are trained in an equal manner. Each one of us have been trained in different organization, different setup. So again, in some institutes, maybe they would talk about it. Some institutes may not even talk about it. Probably handing over, taking over has never been talked as a, as a medical topic or issue. So therefore, you know, why it is not being valued as an important process in the patient care. Then continuity gaps can be another one. For example, somebody has left the patient, but the next person who is supposed to take over has not come. So there is no handing over. The next person who, like, like you said in ambulance, like you said in ambulance, the patient has been brought from another hospital or from a smaller setup where they have not given any discharge or any transfer notes. You are just you know, clueless what exactly needs to be done. Then we all know fatigue really interferes with our attention, memory, concentration, expression, and uh, healthcare is very exhausting, labor intensive. A lot of time you will see because of fatigue, Patient, the, the staff might forget to imp, uh, hand over an important information about the patient and that can lead to a lapse in the care. Time constraints we have talked about just now, how it interferes and volume of information can also be very challenging. Now imagine a place like ICU or CCU or you know um, cat lab or uh, um, a patient after bypass surgery, what will be the volume of information that you need to hand over? It's not small. It's very, very huge and actually practically impossible for any human mind to comprehend and remember. Then confidentiality can also be a challenge. Patient has shared some information with you. You do not know whether I can share it with the next staff or not. You hide it. You don't share it. But for example, a patient who has come as an incident of, you know, uh, drinking something unknowingly. But actually, when you talk to the patient and you identified it was an attempt to suicide. Now you do not know, should I be sharing it with my next staff or not? If you share, the patient would feel, you know, uh, feel breach of trust because the patient shared with you thinking that you will keep it confidential. But you forgot, you did not share because you don't want to break the confidence. But the patient tries again and kills himself or herself. So you can well imagine the consequences of not knowing what needs to be done. So a lot of time other similar information when patients share with us, we are confused whether we can hand it over to the next staff or not. And we know the uh, 
uh, risk also in sharing patient's information. So that can be a challenge. Then we also know the differences in styles of communication, especially in India, if I say we have, how many languages we have, 27 or 22? I think almost like 22 languages and 720 dialects. And we have people coming from various parts of the country and working in one hospital. So everybody has a different style of communication. And plus we have talked about the communication in our style of communication where some people are very passive, some people are active. Some people would communicate, will be forthcoming. Some people will give minimal information. They would not like to elaborate. There are gender differences also, especially when it comes to talking to the gender of opposite sex. You will see people not being very comfortable about talking about certain issues. So anytime, Amreen, have you experienced something like this in labor room? where you have people from the opposite sex working together and you need to talk about patient's information and people find it uncomfortable? No, ma'am, especially only with the attendance of the patients hmm. uh, because uh, most of the time it used to happen that a female uh, uh, was not available with the patient. So hmm. uh, no family member is there, then only husband will come and we cannot make him understand all the things related to the labor and other things. So it used yeah. to be so difficult for us to counsel them. Exactly. Exactly. So there can be see gender differences when it comes to communicating and discussing certain issues with an opposite sex gender can be a challenge for somebody. Cultural background of the patient or us or the other staff can also interfere with the effective communication or effective handing over. We all know hierarchy of decision making is very rigid in most of the setups. So if that's very, very rigid in your setup also, you'll have great challenge in actually bringing in a system where the staff can go up to the consultant and say that uh, this is what my patient needs and you need to give it. See, nurses, especially in Western world, are trained and explained that you are advocate to your patient. You are the one responsible for the patient care. And in case if there is some lapse in the patient care, and you think a resident or a consultant is not doing right, you're supposed to tell about it to the, uh, you know, to, to the consultant without any hesitation. But we know in our country, the hierarchy of decision-making, even between consultant and resident is very rigid. So sometimes if the resident says that, okay, this is what I think is not okay, consultant can snub. And I don't think resident will ever have that courage to tell that this is what is not okay. And this is what needs to be done. The level of respect between physician and nurses, especially in hospitals where, uh, you know, I, I also see now having, you know, a very conflicting relationship in, in the hospital setup, which was not there 20, 30 years ago. But now I see a lot of conflict between residents and nurses. There's a kind of tug of war always, you know, finding faults with each other and dragging each other and blaming each other. So if there is no kind of respect for each other, there's no kind of, you know, uh, value for each other's information, then nobody will voluntarily come forward and give you information that can help you in, you know, uh, managing the patient well. And then level of empowerment. So wherever we empower our juniors, wherever we empower our nurses to come forth and share their information, chances of patient safety are higher. So I remember I was taking a session for a group of nurses. So one of them said, she was a new nurse in one of the hospitals. She said, I was in OT and I was, you know, assisting a very senior gynecologist. And in between, like after the case ended, she counted the number of mops and she said, ma'am, one mop, no, not sorry, not mop, artery clamp. So she was counting the instrument, instruments and she, she found that one of the artery clamp was missing, less, it was less in count. So in a very, you know, uh, fearful way, she said, ma'am, uh, one of the artery clamp is not, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not able to locate it. So that gynecologist was very senior and quite rude also in her way of dealing. So she said, yehi hoga, dekh le, yehi pada hoga. Yehi hoga, dekh le, pada hoga. Imagine the way she's talking. So how do you feel when you have 10, 15 people in the OT around you and somebody talks to you like this? So she, uh, she in a still, you know, you know, the, ma'am, I've counted twice. The second statement that came from the gynecologist, dekha tha, pehle gine the achche se, kahi aise hi bol rahi hai. Now her frustration was rising because her 
uh, work was getting you know interfered or impeded so she said ma'am i counted i have the list of the instrument that i had you know put here on the table kya karna hai fir ab ma'am we need to locate that artery gland kya karu fir se ki ma'am cm manga ke check kar lete hain ek bari in case it is there they got this cm the artery clamp was not in the body but it was between the table and the it had gone down but imagine the struggle she had to undergo to insist on getting the cm and getting the you know getting it identified so wherever we do not empower our staff and we do not respect their opinion chances are they will not come forward and share that information with us and that's very unsafe and that's detrimental also so it's very important to see and these becomes barriers in actually handing over and taking over and also informing the other person we also know the differences in the communication between doctors and nurses because style of communication can be a challenge if the person is aggressive and the nurse is passive or the nurse is not very you know uh, vocal hierarchy we have talked about past experience if earlier if you have been humiliated or embarrassed or kind of you know in uh, publicly in front of others you have been insulted you would not come forward and share that you know uh, talk about it this we have covered i think so we have covered with that example and you understand it even the tone of voice can interfere with the person volunteering the information if you are rude and authoritative and intimidating the other person will slowly close down will will stop uh, interacting with you or stop giving you the information so all and we see this these levels of differences and language can be a problem english can be a problem for some of the staff english i mean they are not good in english so they hesitate talking to doctors because if their doctor speaks very good english the nurse may not be comfortable in talking to them but we need to see the the whole purpose gets defeated the whole purpose gets defeated so now let me quickly take you through the tools of handoff and we we talked about that five piece that we have uh, talked about any other tool if you can uh, recollect if you have heard of is bar is one tool is bar is one is bar is one uh, savita ji have you heard of any tools chandra have you heard of any tools Uh, dr sherwano what tools are you practicing in your uh, setup am i audible or not yes sir but very surprising i am not able to hear anybody's voice are they answering no, no. savita ji are you there sorry mom it was mute so am i audible to you yes you are Uh, tools of hand off you mean in uh, uh, one uh, tools in the hand off we have in our uh, operation kit operation room and mm -hmm. also we will have tools of hand off for um, patients who are taking serum or they are in emergency ward hmm, hmm. so is there any protocol that you are using or you have developed your own template no we do not have any protocol we just use our own template Okay. Okay. We have papers, A4 papers, on that is written name of patient, okay. uh, what preparations doctor want to give, uh, medicines that should be given, then that has a chart, which time which medicine should be given, and there we have a place that uh, that is for note, any special note of doctor have. That's our oh. sample. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Chandana, have you uh, heard of uh, these tools? Yeah, Dr. Savita has answered in the chat box that no, because I'm not involved directly in such a route. I completely agree. And barriers you talked about language, semantic, listening, culture. Absolutely, these are all right. Yeah, yeah. A lot of barriers you have talked about. Thank you, Dr. Kunal. I I saw your message just now. I completely agree. So these are, you know, uh, okay. Coming to the tools of handoff. As some of you are not in patient care, that's why I'm asking you. Have you heard of these uh, tools? but there are a lot of tools available i'm going to talk about couple of them to help you know that when you follow a protocol when you follow a tool it helps you structuring your information 
and it brings everybody on the same page they would know what exactly they need to talk about so i think smr is one of the very you know uh, well known and old uh, tool that we have heard of but i think sbar is now being replaced by isbar and it's it's found more effective so sbar is where you talk about the situation where you give patients details and the reason why you are communicating so the, uh, this is this is about patient so and so this patient is bleeding or is having high grade fever or has rashes on the body so you are talking about this situation in background that is b you are talking about what this patient is about for example it could be a diabetic patient or a thyroid patient or a pneumonia patient so whatever the patients you know significant history about diagnosis or investigation or medicine all that goes in the background assessment is what do you see now for which you are asking intervention so assessment could be that the patient looks very pale or the patient looks very drowsy or the patient has high grade fever or the bp is very low or sugar is very high whatever is your assessment so that's what you are kind of communicating to the person to whom you want to talk about and then recommendation like what do you recommend you want the doctor to come and immediately see or you want to uh you know you you are asking what can i do meanwhile before you come so this is the tool that normally we use for sending a referral call or for a call for the call for intervention so this is now being replaced by another tool and that's called isbar in isbar i is introduction uh, uh s is situation b background a is assessment r recommendation so let me quickly tell you what exactly we mean so in i it's very good idea to tell about to to tell who you are especially if you are calling somebody over phone or if you are writing notes who is writing the notes sir i am doctor so and so or i am i'm nurse so and so or when you are calling and you tell i am sister so and so or i am doctor so and so and i am talking about this patient on bed number this in room number that or whatever the patient's uh, you know details are when you give your introduction in this manner the other person immediately knows whom i am talking to so that per that person starts visualizing okay this is a call from sister so and so or intern so and so or resident resident so and so from medical ward surgical ward gynae ward and then which patient are they talking about then you give patient's name so they can if they have seen the patient earlier they can immediately visualize what it is about s is for the situation to actually tell what is the situation right now so it could be change in vitals fever bleeding pain uh, coughing rashes reaction adverse even change in mental status so all that can be the situation that is part of the present problem for what you want the attention for b is about background where you will actually be telling about what this patient is all about so it is about the diagnosis with which the patient has come or some allergies diabetes hypertension all these things will be part of background a will be your immediate assessment so what have you assessed because now you are eyes and ear for the person who is away so you would be writing about what is your understanding of patient's condition about like when you talk about the vitals so when you say vitals are stable or when you say the patient is gasping or when you say the patient Uh, is you know uh, the the bp is very low so the you, the other person gets an idea how serious is the condition then sensorium severity of pain uh, pain bleeding condition some critical lab report all this will be part of assessment because this is what you have been able to assess and then r is for recommendation or request so maybe you will say you i want you to come in, immediately come and see or you may say tell me what can i do before you come So suppose for for example if the patient has some allergic reaction so you you then the doctor is away so you would be kind of asking so what do you want me to do by the time you come patient is asthmatic the doctor is away you you are asking tell me what can you do so what you are trying to say you are trying to ask if i can do anything and also you are recommending to the person i mean you need to come immediately this patient requires immediate attention and then you you are giving your thoughts about it another tool that you may have heard of is i pass the button how many of you have heard of this i pass the button has anybody heard of it it's likely longer and this is also being used in many places so i pass the button is quite similar to is bar so first of all introduce yourself then the patient p for the patient 
is your assessment situation what is the current status or current situation that you want attention for s second s is for safety concern so for example in that situation also what do you think is most important that needs to be attended or what's a safety concern <clears throat> b <clears throat> stands for the background and the comorbidities previous episodes and current medicines family details etc a is what are the actions to be taken and brief rationale of uh, those actions t is timing is it urgent or we can wait or they can just verbally give you instruction and you can go ahead with it o is ownership who is responsible so when you are saying that okay that you need to come it's your missing responsibility or it's my responsibility so you need to be very clear about the ownership and then and what happens next that is uh, what changes are you anticipating and what contingencies are you imagining so i pass the baton is also one of the tools being used you know uh, in various hospital these are some of the you know reporting tools this is for the case sheet especially when you are writing a case file soap is a very common uh, tool that is recommended uh, and i have given details about this in that book that i have uh, shared with you fundamentals of chemistry in that i have talked about it so first you will be writing your subjective data where you write about the symptoms past medical histories allergies or whatever comorbidities are objective data is what you have examined now and what is your assessment a stands for clinical impression of the patient and p for the uh, plan of uh, patient management similarly there is another tool called mibt which is when you are actually you know talking about the injury yeah. for mechanism of injury injury is noted vitals and treatment so i'm sure you'll get many more such tools on google search <clears throat> you can choose whatever tool is required in in the department that you are focusing on so one of the communication requirement when you are handing over or taking over is first of all get the person's attention even if it is on phone the person has to i mean uh, uh, become attentive and for that reason it's always a good idea to give your introduction give the introduction of the patient also confirm that the person on the other side is so and so also confirm can i talk to you for a minute we normally don't ask this we start talking maybe the person is not in that state of mind to actually listen to you maybe busy doing something so and and you start talking and that person says can i call you back in 5 minutes i am in the middle of a surgery or i'm just completing closing my case so it's important to make sure that the other person is ready to listen and is attentive if that is happening face to face in person make eye contact and face the person look at the person and talk so that you get complete attention of the person use the person's name to confirm one that you are talking to the person and also to get their attention express your concern like in the tools that we have talked about use tools like is bar s bar whatever suits in that situation if him, if essential reassert in case if the, per, the person is not understanding or not taking your the thing you can't just say informed no you need to reassert and also you know escalate in case if that is not addressed amicably Now, whatever decision is reached that needs to be noted down and if it's not you know addressed then you need to escalate to the next person so that you are able to ensure that the communication actually happened and an action is taken so let's do this uh, exercise i've given you this uh, a case uh, where a patient rajesh 50 years old is a, is a case of rta brought to your emergency multiple minor injuries no visible sign of previous injury complaining of diplopia there is no visible external injury to the eye and his vitals are stable but seems to be slightly confused so you are writing your referral so if i ask you to write in the format of is bar what all will go where try your hands
Okay, for Isbar, I'll give you the uh, format. Give me one second. I just copy and paste. Okay, Mr. Rajesh, uh, 50 years old male with stable vitals and no external injury, but the diplopia and confusion are brought in falling RTA. Okay, very brief and crisp. Uh, Sorry, it's not complete. Actually, it okay. got, uh, uh, the enter got pressed. So I, I know it happens. I, I agree. <laughs> That's okay. So how many of you are able to identify what will go in I, uh, S, B, A, R? Okay, Dr. Kunal has written introduction. I'm Dr. Kunal and I'm referring patient, Mr. Rajesh, 50 years old, male patient. Situation is being referred for complaints of diplobia or uh, vision. Background, case of RTA. Assessment, multiple minor injuries, no visible sign of previous injury, no visible external injury, vital stable. And recommendation, please assess for diplopia and confusion. I think again, quite crisp and quite clear. Thank you. So if I may share the, okay, Dr. Amreen has also written. Dr. Amreen Shah, RMO on duty, uh, casualty department. Uh, S is Mr. Rajesh. Uh, it, it will go in uh, introduction. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay. But it can go in, go in introduction and in situation, but introduction means your introduction and patient's introduction also. So in this also, you see uh, details have been given in S. You have identified yourself. I'm Dr. So-and-so in emergency ward. Situation is, I would like you to come and see Mr. Rajesh, 50-year-old male on bed number three. He's complaining of diplopia in the right eye. Background is that it's a RTA case uh, brought by police, multiple minor injuries all over the body, no apparent grievous injury. Assessment is vitals are stable, but seems to be slightly confused. And R is, will you be able to see him at the earliest? Or what would you like me to do in the meantime? Wonderful. So that means initially it may, you may find it difficult. But once you start practicing, you will get an knack of doing it. And even when you are training your staff, make them do a lot of exercises. I have, uh, I'm showing this slide here. You can develop your own slides and make them do this. Start with simple one. Go from simple to complex. And that will help you train your, you know, staff in, uh, in explaining them how to go about using ISBA. Again, Dr. Shahir Banu has also sent a similar uh, this thing, uh, format. Okay. Dr. Anuradha also has written similar. Good, good. It's a good attempt. I think all of you are doing a good attempt. Try doing it, you know, with your team so that you also learn and they also become comfortable with the idea of this bar. Then that will become their way of communicating and slowly these things will start crystallizing. So ask them to remember Isbar, follow Isbar. So slowly they will take, 
they will they will definitely learn but that's the message that they must actually learn to communicate in a structured manner sir patient 4 ka number jo hai bed number 4 pe jo patient hai usko bahut headache ho raha hai कौन बोल रहा है कहां से बोल रहा है बेड नंबर 4 पे कौन सा पेशेंट है कौन से डिपार्टमेंट की बात कर रहे हो एंड इफ दैट्स अ कंसलटेंट विजिटिंग मल्टीपल हॉस्पिटल्स कौन से हॉस्पिटल से कॉल है ये भी नहीं पता है ना इफ इट्स एन अननोन नंबर सो इट्स ऑलवेज गुड आईडिया इफ इट्स एन एक्सटर्नल कंसलटेंट देन मे बी इज विजिटिंग मल्टीपल हॉस्पिटल्स कौन से हॉस्पिटल में कौन सा बेड नंबर 4 कौन सा वार्ड एवरीथिंग इज अ कंफ्यूजन सो इट्स ऑलवेज गुड टू slowly they will pick up but then they will learn that they have to first identify themselves then identify the patient and also check that am i speaking to doctor so and so so that you are very sure that the information you are sharing is with the right person now the benefits of proper handover is that first of all i think we can if we can remember these couple of things you will never make a mistake one is continuity of care if i am handing over the patient properly automatically the next shift staff will know that what needs to be done patient safety is ensured definitely there will be decreased errors in patient care decreased repetition also a lot of time you know some procedure or some investigations are repeated when they are not communicated that this investigation has been done or what has been the finding and if we have not been able to note down and then automatically if all this is taken care of patient satisfaction would go up uh, and uh, professional satisfaction also will go up so uh, one of the this is i i found this interesting so i thought i must share with all of you that one of the ways to actually implement it in your setup you know to implement uh, effective handover is first of all determine the critical information that needs to be communicated so not like everything and not like nothing what is most important that needs to go as one of the essential information use standardized tool such as some form some templates and checklist so if you say verbally is bar probably they will they will make mistake but if you give them a template on a card and that card is put just next to the telephone uh, station and the staff is supposed to look at that format and then say chances are they'll be able to remember more accurately because initially it will take them time to you know. so similarly even for writing a referral this thing if we have a referral format and we have this captions as subtitles resident or nurse will know i have to write this i have to talk about this i have to talk about comorbidities i have to talk about the present situation so automatically it will become more structured if possible use face to face communication and in telephonic communication or communication because that's the way where you can have you know uh, uh, dialogue if it is just a written note then it is more like a monologue there is no scope for clarifying or checking so if possible if you are sending a referral if you can simultaneously make a call and tell sir i am sending a referral to you for this patient the doctor on the other side can ask you and check with you what um, whatever information that person requires more then combine sources of information and communicate it all at one time so whatever information you need to give give it in one set not like in a broken pieces and then make sure that the receiver gets the following minimum information that when you will have a format that this has to be told when you are passing the information and then whenever you develop a tool or a system include all team members even if it is just for the nurses or for the doctor but you if you have input from all every i mean all the team members you would know uh, uh, i mean what is the expectation of each member so the benefit of standardized communication uh, you know uh, if you are following some format some tool some uh, way structured way is that it is not person oriented it is patient oriented now for example if the person on this side is good at communication probably that person will really explain very well uh, in my other batch i have uh, you know professor of gyne she says every first year student first year pg student who's who comes in uh, you know that person is asked to uh, you know uh, kind of uh, when they are supposed to brief their consultants at the end of the day what has happened during the day that person would invariably end up into giving information in a very haphazard manner because each one of them would have a different way of communicating on the contrary if they have a format that they have to follow this format i'm sure 
even the first year PG will be able to give the information in a structured manner. So the focus is on the structure and the patient and not on the person. Now, some of us who have communication challenges, who are not good at you know, explaining, they will have great challenge in explaining things in detail. Standardized format will also allow all parties to have a common expectation. Okay, I can expect the information in S bar or S bar or I pass the button. So what is going to be communicated? How the communication is structured and what are the required element? Everybody would know that this is going to come in the time to come. So whenever you are planning to start implementing this as a, as a you know, hospital uh, management, I'm now talking about it, I would suggest you assess all points where handoff occurs. So visit all departments where you think more lapses are happening just because of improper handing over. Concurrently monitor process mapping, you know, monitor process at all points. So you'll get to see what is happening right now. Then conduct gap analysis. So what you think? is leading to error and what can be done, kappa, what can be included in the thing. Then identify your champion. So everybody will not buy in, everybody will not agree with you. So initially you will have to focus on people who are ready to buy your idea and just ask them to start implementing. And if you can even do a small study to see how many laps apps were happening earlier and how many laps are ha happening now in a gap of say a month, you'll be able to identify and also showcase to all others that see this is what was the number of errors happening before we started implementing it. And this is the situation now. But identify people who are seriously wanting to implement it. Then select a consistent approach of handoff, develop a policy and procedure around it, educate the staff based on whatever you are planning to do, implement the policy, monitor and report findings, and then keep updating the procedure because in one day you will not get the final product you'll have to keep refining it on those of you who are familiar with nabh manuals and sops we all write sops and then we write what changes we need to make in the next manual or whatever has been our you know whatever whenever it was updated the last updated and signed by whom so similarly even in handoff tool you will never have a final product in one day it will need refining but we need to take one step forward at least. So I think the take home message that I would like you to go back with is that 80% of the errors that happen in patient care are because of the information loss because of ineffective handing over tools. So that's the importance of you know, handing over. It's a very important communication for the continuity of care and patient safety. And you maybe now you can start you know, observing, maybe you can spend two weeks just to observe the lapses that are happening because we are not you know properly handing over then uh, giving handoff while you're giving handoff please be specific concise and deliver the information in a standardized format and while receiving handoff summarize what you have understood so that the other person knows that you have really understood and listen attentively uh, attentively or actively by anticipating potential use issue any questions I'm trying to hurry up because I know we are we are we have two presentations to be done. So I really had to rush through the last couple of slides. Any questions about handoff? And whenever you do this as a topic with your team, because ultimately we want you to use this you know, training people, integrate a lot of activities. You could even develop a self-reflection questionnaire to help them see the lapses that are happening under their care, which are not reported, but then they are cognizant of that, those lapses. Any question, any feedback, any comment on this? So how many of you already knew about handoff tools? Raise your hands. Dr. Kunal, because you have attended that program. Okay. Dr. Anuradha, you have also done it? Okay. Good. But for, okay, Dr. Tanu also has an idea about it. Oh, S-Bar actually. I only saw S-Bar. 
I know S bar is quite often discussed in number of programs. Yeah, but for many of us, it's a new blessing. So, what is your learning from these sessions, Amrini? If I may ask you, ma'am, actually, we used to do that in the same way, but I was not aware that it is S bar tool which we were using. We used to Wonderful. follow that format and written. We used to give handover. Very good. Very good. So you're already following it. Yes, ma'am. That's very good. That's very good. And you find it helpful? Yes, ma'am. Very helpful. Very helpful. Very helpful. I completely agree that this is a very effective tool if you start implementing in your, you know, workplace. Uh, Namrita, how about you? How are you using these tools? Are you using these tools in the patient handover? Ma'am, we are not using this. Uh, actually, we are not using any formats, but we are using some for nurses. We have the nurses uh, note, and for doctors, we have the progress note. So there are only days to write everything and days to hand over. Mm -hmm. A specific format is not there, ma'am, but they mm. uh, are doing. I it. know some handing over must be definitely happening, but then not in a very structured manner. So, do you find these uh, this issue, this topic and these details helpful to you? Yes, ma'am, it's very helpful. Thank you. So, Dr. Sherbano, this, this is how you are also handing over in your uh, setup? Uh, yes, ma'am, we do, but we do. Uh, we have a lot of problems, like you uh, told us about ice bar, and uh, we should take notes and ask once again. Uh, mostly when we take a handoff to another doctor, then we just they uh, gave this medicine to this patient, gave this medicine to this patient, these are okay, just take care of one of them or two of them, or sometimes uh, because uh, we will be in hurry to go home and another doctor is in hurry to come. And sometimes mm. patients will be in hurry that they want to leave the hospital and go, then we forget so many things. I have been written down so many notes. <laughs> I, <laughs> Yes, uh, these are all the issues that I see in our yeah. daily work that uh, then I told with myself that tomorrow morning when I go to hospital, I should tell them that these points are our mistakes and we'll make them. And also I noted to how to make a chart and how to make a template for them, especially in neonatal ward because our patients mostly will be uh, premature babies. Mm -hmm. uh, the handoff between nurses that doesn't, uh, they don't take a handoff completely. Very good, very good. So what I will recommend here is to start with, don't give them a very long list of questions. Till now, they were not doing in a systematic manner. Give them first just five points, that these five points you have to hand over about each patient. Then after it is implemented for a month, you see that, okay, now they are using it. You can add another couple of points to it. And then slowly you can add some more points that you think that are very important. If you have a long list of questionnaire, usually that's going to be mechanically filled in and not actually handed over in a systematic manner, the way we want it to happen in spirit. Okay. Thank you so, so much, ma'am. These yeah, decisions but, are very, very useful. Yeah. Thank you. So start with the simple. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Ma uh, there are different tools, hmm. so, like five piece is one is bar. Hmm. Uh, do you suggest a single tool used in all the departments, or it can be customized in to each department? Oh yes, you have to customize to each department. Absolutely, absolutely. As I said, that maybe uh, in a medical ward, it may be very basic, but in CCU it will be very elaborate. Okay. Yeah, it has to, but then there are certain basic ingredients that have to be there. Then you can add on anything that you want to add. But to start with, I will say start with the basic. Right away, if you go and give them a three-page, you know, a, 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 a handing over tool for each patient, a lot of time we get to hear this from doctors and nurses. We feel more like clerk than doctors and nurses because we are doing a lot of writing. work. So reduce their writing. Reduce their writing, minimize their writing, but the information has to be, uh, you know, added. Information has to be given. That's something yes. we need to always remember. Yeah. Um, I feel uh, most of the hospitals, smaller hospitals, nursing homes, they might be just having a kind of register with no format at all. Absolutely, absolutely. I completely agree with you. So that means 
if that is also not being followed so you can imagine the information lapse even in that place will be very obvious very very obvious okay. so even if in that small setup also if you can give them a a small tool simple tool that at least this information should go even when you are transferring the patient out of the hospital or on daily basis when you are handing over nurses are handing over and doctors are handing over they they, they can build one they can construct one for them and there's no need to always follow only is bar as bar you can develop your own setup um, or your own template whatever you require right no sure. they, they, this has also been developed by somebody we can customize it for our requirement definitely yes, any any more questions or feedback dr tanu how do you see it implementing in your setup unmute your device now uh, actually i am not working anymore but yes uh, if i were then i would like to implement uh, is far because mm. uh, as you said it's very informal way of uh, handing over mm. and mm. though we have been talking to them time and again it mm. has been a very people oriented approach where you we say you know you must do it you must do it mm. but mm. like if we give them a tool then mm. it becomes a standardized format which everybody can follow so that would yeah. be very useful yes. absolutely absolutely thank you so uh, i think i'll share the link for the feedback form and then we go ahead with the presentation by dr kunal and pita uh, ji has also joined so we can have a presentation by her i know yeah, you must be very tired so so i know we are in bhuj and there's this hospital thing happening and i've just come to the hotel so yeah. <laughs> yes um, can i share yes. the link right yeah. no dr kunal will be presenting yeah. first is it okay with you okay. uh, Huh? i'm okay then yeah, you can set it down you can take a cup of tea or coffee if you want to take and then uh, okay i just come everybody is down for dinner but i have come up to the room to just join the meeting oh my goodness <laughs> so uh, dr yeah. kunal i have shared i have made you also kind of you know you can uh, share your screen if screen if you want yes but after the uh, feedback feedback form yeah yeah So I have received five uh, responses as of now. We'll wait for another two minutes for everyone to complete.
So I've received six responses. Uh, Chandana, are you working on the feedback form? Okay, I think we can start. Yeah. Uh, is the screen visible, ma'am? Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay, so very good evening to all of you. And uh, the topic for today is introducing a topic in an interesting way. Out of the various methods that we can use to introduce a topic in an interesting way, the method I will be discussing today with all of you is by using a video in our presentations. So let us watch a video, a video, a quite exciting video with fast cars and let us go to a racetrack where we'll be watching what happens to Formula One cars in less than two seconds. But before the video, I would request all of you that you just note down in a word or two what would be your observations and how can you relate the video to a clinical setting. And after the video, we can unmute ourselves and share those few words. So let us watch what is happening here. Still, it was fast, so in a bit more slow motion. Yes, I would request uh, all of you to please unmute yourself and share your observations in a word or two and where you can relate it in a clinical setup. Yes, please. Uh, you can unmute yourself and 
Please share your observation. Dr. Uh, Anupanda, please. Yes. Uh, so the two words that I can think of as good teamwork. That good is required teamwork. in healthcare settings also. Yes. Correct, correct. And any specific area in clinical setup where you would see a situation like this? Rightly said in the chat box, emergency department, the patient Correct. comes very quickly and we have to act very quickly. Yes, yes, very much. Anyone else would like to share? I think Dr. Sherbanu has a point. Yes, to Dr. Sherbanu, please. Uh, at first, it shows uh, teamwork, a uh, group work, which all of the jobs and all of the responsibilities are divided well to who should do what. And it shows the speed of the work. And uh, in my idea, it shows that if all of, uh, all of works do by teamwork, do by a group, and uh, every person will be responsible for a part, then that work be uh, do faster. And in a clinic, like uh, for example, if we have a patient, nurse knows uh, that what should I do? The security guard knows what should I do? The doctor knows what should I do? Then uh, that work become uh, so much better and faster. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Something, yeah. uh, I, yes, Dr. I feel uh, that uh, in this emerg emergency course in a hospital, code red, code blue, I think yes. uh, that, that is what I relate. Yes, yes. All of your observations are quite uh, very close to what we are going to discuss today. It talks about a lot of things. And in a clinical setup, when a patient is handed over or handled by various team members and a lot of gadgets and equipments are used when the patient is shifted from one critical area to another. So the topic for today is clinical handover or handover in clinical settings and what we can learn from the Formula One pit crew. Just as a Formula One car is surrounded by around 20 people and everybody is doing a job, a patient in a clinical setting has a lot of gadgets around, a lot of equipments, and a team of doctors, nurses, anesthetists, everyone working together. So that is how we'll be talking today about handover in clinical settings and what we can learn from Formula One pit stop. So that was the end of my demonstration of pedagogy. And uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, what we'll be discussing is, why do we need to use videos, first of all? What are the different ways that we can use? What are the advantages, disadvantages, do's and don'ts? And few examples of where all we can use a video to introduce our topic. So first question first, why do we need it? I think we all would agree, videos make presentations very dynamic. It's a great way to put our message across. And it's a great opportunity to connect with the audience and make an impact. Obviously, there is a science behind it that two mental representations, the verbal and the visual, would make a much stronger connection. In one of the studies, it was found that only 4% of professionals always use a video in their presentation. So I think rest 96% are losing on a great opportunity by not using a video. What are the different ways? It can be either a part of our actual topic, maybe the theme of the topic, like we did in our video, where we are actually comparing a clinical setup with a Formula One pit stop. It can be a popular video, maybe a movie or an advertised clip, which, is, which gives a symbolic message and relates to our topic. It can be a real life video also. For example, if you want to learn about a, maybe a fire incident of how in an ICO, the fire spread very quickly we can use some actual incidents or videos of that. And as we have seen in our uh, healthcare communication where Dr. Indu ma'am has recorded her own videos. So we can use those videos in our presentation as well. We can ask questions before the video or after the video. We can also add some narrations to the video. The most interesting part is we can use the same video for different topics. For example, we can use the video that we saw for handovers, for teamwork, for, for job descriptions, for leadership, for technical things in healthcare setups, and so on. What changes only is the question and how we uh, discuss the video mm -hmm. further. The advantages of using a video, first of all, whenever we start our introduction, either people are settling down or recurring from the previous presentation. So a video and introduction would be a very good part to gain their attention. It always gives something to remember and the recall of actual information lasts much longer, maybe for years also. 
it works at all levels of audience lower to higher levels of literacy or understanding and everyone likes a good video in a presentation we can immediately start a discussion following a video because that tension is already gained and we can uh, start getting their opinion or even discuss start discussing the video also videos can make a very impactful small time and you can compress a lot of information into a small part and you can touch the emotions of the audience as well because things which the audience sees and they would feel rather than uh, we speak by words there are few disadvantages of using a video as well when the content of the video overpowers the topic or there are many sub topics in a video then it might get difficult to focus the audience on a single topic and at times we may miss the point or the actual topic when we use humor or a movie clip or some famous stand up uh, comedian or something like that then the audience start taking things lightly and the seriousness or importance of the topic is also lost a very sometimes we use very long videos or famous or controversial videos and people start debating and things might go haywire as well and we are totally lost in the introduction when the videos are very technical or there are very technical things in the video people might not be able to understand it so a good way to overcome would be to add a narration and describe the steps what is being uh, shown in the video obviously by using videos we are totally dependent on technology so we should always have a plan b if the technology doesn't support us on that day and our introduction doesn't go as per plan again there would be late comers in our presentations and someone might miss the introduction video only and so th during the whole presentation they might not understand what we are trying to convey these are few of the disadvantages of using videos few things that uh, i would suggest while using videos always be excited about the introduction if we don't feel that this video will fit our introduction or our topic better not to use it and find something more suitable so our excitement of the topic should be visible in the introduction it should match the topic obviously it should be relevant and we should be able to establish a link between the video and the topic which is to be conveyed and the questions are also to be focused and relevant we have to evoke the right emotions in the right amount we don't want our audience to be getting into deeper levels of shock or sadness or happiness so our videos should be such that they just give the right message in the right proportion because if at times some videos would be making people very emotional and it takes a lot of time for them to recover and again focus on the main topic it is a good idea to embed or insert the video into the presentation audience should have a seamless experience it saves our time and effort also and it feels as if video is a part of the presentation and not just an addition and the most important thing is play replay reach the venue check whether the person sitting in the farthest seat of the audience will be able to see the video and listen to the audio very clearly otherwise the whole point of using a video for the introduction might not work out few things which we need to take care don't tell about what you are presenting or don't reveal the topic a certain suspense or mystery behind the video would make people focus on the video more rather than sharing the topic topic beforehand no matter how engaging the video is it is not a movie so with reducing attention spans a 30 to 60 second video would be very good the upper limit we can keep is maybe 3 minutes but not very longer than that something we should never do is use offensive or controversial videos which cannot be presented in a professional setting so we should make sure that we are not inclined towards any such videos not to leave the audience guessing for too long at times our audience might not respond or might not understand so rather than keeping them guessing for too long we should start introducing our topic ourselves we should never use videos from unauthentic sources there are a lot of fake videos going around everywhere and we should not fall prey to that so always check before using the video about copyrights about its authenticity a good idea would be to give creator the due credit and use a link which goes to the original video 
we don't need a video when the topic itself is very interesting so no need to use a video for introducing a very interesting topic rather we can keep the video for towards the middle or the end part of the presentation to demonstrate something so let us see a few examples where we can use videos to introduce a topic when we are doing presentations on cliche topics like leadership team building motivation where a lot of things are already said and a lot of people have read a lot of things on that for example in a clinical setting when we are talking about hand hygiene medication errors to develop interest we can use videos in the introduction few topics which are presumed to be very boring when we are training someone on documentation or sop writing we can use videos to introduce it and make it more interesting when the acceptance of the topic is less such as healthcare communication or when we are trying to teach etiquettes to someone we can use videos when we need an eye opener or change in perspective for example when we need to learn from different industries maybe we need to learn checklists from uh, aviation industry or lean six sigma from toyota or maybe in this case when we want to learn handovers from the formula 1 team we can use videos and try to compare what we are trying to convey when the audience knowledge of the topic is very good we have to repackage the topic and make it more interesting for example when we are talking about antibiotic resistance to clinicians by using a video and sensitizing them more would be very helpful and last when similar topics are covered before our turn it happens many times in conferences and workshops when the same theme is given for a number of uh, speakers and by the time our turn is there a lot of things are already said at that time a good video in the introduction would have a great impact on the audience and would make our presentation very successful so that's it for my time thank you everyone thank you so much dr kunal i think it was a very concise precise and timely completed <laughs> uh presentation you, uh, i mean you have really stuck to the time 15 minutes means dot 15 minutes congratulations i really appreciate thank you i really appreciate so any questions about uh, video presentation as one of the pedagogies and it's a very interesting pedagogy that i would recommend to one and all any comments or feedback excellent one i think yes dr kunal it's an excellent presentation no doubt you have covered almost everything about it the videos yeah yeah very crisp and informative see everybody is complimenting you dr kunal thank you so much <laughs> so good and i would really recommend you know using videos uh, for your uh, making a point because a lot of time uh, with the 2 minutes video you can actually explain a lot if you remember that Uh, a fourth set of behavior that we talked about passive communication passive aggressive i mean had i explained it for 10 minutes probably even then it wouldn't have made that point but you saw me doing it and you could and the good thing is you can make your own videos i would i would advise you to make your own videos if you have a phone and if you have a, your team member you can make your own in house videos that's what i think i recommend rather than taking videos from the western world and then you know using them where the language can be a challenge or pronunciation can be a, a difficult thing make your own videos in the english local language and that really has a lot of impact i would really recommend that any any other thought about the videos any questions you have about videos as a pedagogy ठीक है जी थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर कुणाल वंडरफुल प्रेजेंटेशन या थैंक यू सो नाउ वी रिक्वेस्ट प्रीता जी टू शेयर हर प्रेजेंटेशन विद अस आई नो यू हैड अ लॉन्ग आई डू माय बेस्ट बट आई हैव अ वेरी अनस्टेबल इंटरनेट योर ओके लेट्स सी इफ इट इज टू दिस थिंग देन मेबी वी विल शेड्यूल इट फॉर द नेक्स्ट नो नॉट पॉसिबल बिकॉज़ माय इंटरनेट इज येट अनस्टेबल इफ एवरीबॉडी इज ओके देन आई कैन रीशेड्यूल इट नेक्स्ट टाइम i cannot hear half the things theek hai i think it's already uh, i think uh, 10 15 for all of you quite quite late but i'm thankful to you to have made you I'm know sorry. effort to be here and to make your presentation i really appreciate that that shows the seriousness <laughs> of uh, what you 
Let's hope that you will be able to do it uh, next time. Uh, but the topics, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the two topics that we are supposed to cover one is breaking of bad news and disclosure of medical error. They are both very important and little time-consuming because we'll be doing role plays around it and watching a couple okay. of videos also. So, but then uh, we'll see. We'll try to accommodate. So we'll maybe spend another fifteen minutes, extra fifteen minutes. Yeah, extra. because the internet is. Hello, it's very I unstable here. I don't. Yeah. I understand. That's okay. Yeah. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So we end it here. Thank you, one and all, for being up till so long, for being thank here you, and being active participant. Thank you. Good night, all thank of you. you. Good night, all.